Grapevine. Welcome back to another episode of The Grapevine. I'm Susie. Susan. Eva. And uh, today we have a really fantastic and exciting episode. Actually, it's going to be a three-part episode, and it's a really important one for all of us to know. Uh, I'd like to start off with a verse from the Bible, and that is, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. That's 1 Peter 3.15. And if you attended the Easter liturgy, the resurrection liturgy, you'll know that's part of the Catholic epistle that was read. Um, well, I want to know, uh, I'm not going to ask the ladies yet, but how do you at home, how do you give a defense for the hope and the joy that is in you? Uh, if you're saying it's by blind faith, I don't think that you really understand that verse. Uh, and I don't think that's what St. Peter intended or the Lord when you are giving a defense. You've got to be more like an attorney and provide evidence. So are you providing evidence because blind faith isn't going to cut it these days? And we do need to have faith in all things, um, but we again, we need to provide evidence. And, uh, if, and today we're lucky enough to have an amazing guest who is going to give us the evidence for why we believe in the Bible, how can we defend the hope and the joy that is in us, and uh, that would be Dr. Grady McMurtry. Uh, before we actually dig in and ask him a bunch of questions, I want to give a little bit of information about him so you know um, what his credentials are on this subject. Uh, Dr. McMurtry is a former skeptic and a teacher of evolution for 10 years. He has a BS from the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture and MS from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science. He's got a Doctor of Divinity from the School of Theology, Columbus, Georgia. He also has an honorary doctorate from Mid-Continent University in Mayfield, Kentucky. Uh, if For our viewers out there who don't understand an honorary doctorate, uh, this is an award that is designed to give formal public recognition to eminent scholars who have made substantial, original, and distinguished contributions to knowledge in the humanities. Dr. McMur McMurtry is also a lifetime Mensa and Intertel member. Uh, these are high IQ societies. Being a member of these societies basically means that you have to score at or above the 99th percentile, the top 1% in the world of these uh, intelligence tests. So we are actually going to be talking to a real life genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's not intimidating. Yeah, not intimidating at all. He has also appeared worldwide on TV and radio, conferences, universities, colleges. He's participated in debates. Uh, and he has many published books. Here's one of them. I finished reading it just this Saturday, and it's a wonderful book. He has many published articles and plenty of DVDs. If you want to know more about Dr. McMurtry, and there's a lot more, but I couldn't put it down, you need to go visit his website, www.creationworldview.org. And we're so excited to get to pick his brain today. Welcome, Dr. McMurtry, and thank you for coming and joining us on the panel of The Grapevine. It's, it's my pleasure, and I have the most pickable brain you've ever met in your life. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to believe. I don't think Menza would agree with that, or Dertal. <laughs> oh, it's still pickable, regardless. <laughs> Uh, well, we just want to dive right in and, and ask you uh, a bunch of questions on uh, why we sh why should we believe in the Bible, and uh, and it'll help us give a defense for the hope that is in us. Um, our first question, or my first question, is uh, we often hear from skeptics that the Bible is a book of fairy tales. I mean, I've spoken to a ton of people who are not who are non-believers or unbelievers, and they laugh at some of the stories in the Bible. Uh, for example, they laugh at the story about the ark and about Noah and the worldwide flood, about anybody who's, eight, who's reached, I guess, the age of 900 and something. They think that's ridiculous. Um, and they think that the creation days, the, the six creation days, are also ridiculous because they believe the earth is billions and billions and billions of years old. Um, so why should we believe these stories and what evidence is there to prove it? Well, Let's you're, start with creation days, because I know I've been a skeptic on that. Well, okay. First of all, of course, I was an evolutionist. I believed it. I taught it from the seventh grade to the university level. Uh, during all that time, I was never taught that there was a perfectly valid scientific alternative to the various theories of evolution. You have to remember there is no such thing as the theory of evolution. There are many theories of evolution. And so, while being an evolutionist, I was not uh, a militant evolutionist. I was not mad at God. I wasn't shaking my fist in his face and so forth. But I, I believe in evolution, simply considered God to be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. 
But at the age of 27, I decided to decide whether Jesus was telling the truth or not. I'd been around Christianity, obviously, 27 years. Um, and growing up when I did, 50s and 60s, um, Christianity was still very much in vogue in the United States. And so you couldn't grow up even as an evolutionist without knowing that Christianity was there and knowing some of the basic tenets. After all, we celebrated Easter and Christmas. and So I got to the point of really being fed up. You know, either Jesus is telling the truth or he's not. Let's establish it once and for all. And so what I did was for six months by myself without any other human being guiding me. Now, of course, I look back now and realize the Holy Spirit was, but but without another human being guiding the process, trying to say things to me and so forth, but just allowing myself to study the whole issue, looking at the Bible for the first time and reading it, uh, realizing that the four Gospels are actually legal depositions. They're eyewitness accounts. Uh, looking at the outside histories. And, and you have to realize that there are literally dozens of references in history outside of the Bible about Jesus Christ. So no rational historian denies his existence. Now, there are people who will deny it, but it's irrational. So no rational historian denies his existence. The question is, who is he? What was he? You know, Was he the Son of God or was he a man? Period. After six months, I came to the realization that he really was the Son of God. Now, this is, again is a six-month process, but to me, one of the things that struck most was that there were over 500 people we know of specifically who would die without recanting that they had seen him after the resurrection. Right. Now, no human being will voluntarily die to support the lie of another. Now, there have been good people, men and women, who died to support a lie. But it wasn't voluntary. If you'll allow me to give an illustration, in World War II, there were good German soldiers who were Christians mm -hmm. fighting for Hitler and for German Reich, but they were not doing it voluntarily. They were coerced into it, knowing that their families would suffer if they didn't and so forth. So that's coercion. Mm -hmm. But nobody will knowingly, voluntarily lay down their lives simply to support the lie of another. So I came to the conclusion that Jesus was telling the truth. Now, I've been a seeker of truth my entire lifetime, uh, even from the day I was born, basically. And I know it sounds like a bold statement, but it's true. I've always been a seeker of truth. And therefore, when you, when you find truth, you have to accept it whether you like it or not. And we have to stipulate, too, that, that unless you are willing to learn, you'll never be willing to change. I agree. So those who, who are unwilling to learn will never change. And so they have an opinion, they have a religion. Evolution is not science, it's a religion. It's the religion of secular humanism, which is a recognized religion, by the way, in case you didn't know this in the United States, but even, even the Supreme Court has recognized yeah. secular humanism as a, as a religion. It's a, a faith believed in with ardor, is the terminology. Right, right. And so after the six month period of time, in a search by myself, in a room by myself, I became a Christian. It's a, it was an intellectual decision. I knew so little about it that I actually made an appointment with an associate pastor of a church in the area. He was kind enough to allow me to come in, and, and I explained the story, a little longer version of it, and he asked me the question, so is your decision firm? And I said, if you knew me, you wouldn't ask the question. <laughs> and that kind of took him back, and he said, okay. Open up the Bible, said, you got to make it public. Open up the Bible, you need to be baptized. And I said, fine, it's there. Did that. But, of course, the problem was that just made me a saved evolutionist. Right. Now, uh, you'd mentioned that I'm a member of Mensa and Intertel both, and uh, so I'm smart enough to know i got a problem. <laughs> you know, how, how do you, how do you uh, teach and believe in evolution when you have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe? Right, right. Yeah. right. So what I did then was I spent 16 more months with a blank sheet of paper asking the question, did God use evolution to create what we see around us? Was what I had learned and taught others okay, right. or was it wrong? And you could really trust the Bible about it only being 6,000 years old and, and, again, as you say, created in six literal 24-hour days. And so I studied that for 16 months. I think that's an ample amount of time. I looked at law, science law. So I looked at scientific law, I looked at natural process, I looked at physical evidence, and came to the conclusion there's absolutely no science to support evolution whatsoever. It is a fairy tale for adults, and that's all it is. Well, that's actually really good to hear, because uh, you won't find too many evolutionists saying that at all, ever. Well, no, but it is a fairy tale for adults, because 
I want to again stipulate because of your question. Christianity is the only rational, reasonable, logical, and evidence-based faith in the world. All other religions are irrational, illogical, unreasonable, and unscientific, period. And so, for instance, the, the last question I asked myself at the end of 16 months was, could the law of gravity ever evolve? Now, I realize you're not a scientist, per se, but, but is it possible that gravity could ever have evolved, it started as something less and evolved to become what it is? And the answer, of course, is absolutely no. It's not possible. Therefore, it had to come into existence whole and complete. Therefore, it had to be created. Right. Now, that immediately tells you that if something is created, there has to be a creator. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you think about it, if you believe in evolution, then you're saying there has to be an evolver. Right. <laughs> you know? Someone's got to start it. Yep. Well, even Charles Darwin did not believe that rocks became alive by random chance. He did give credit to a creator god. Right though he really was an atheist, but he understood that rocks do not become alive by random chance. Was he an agnostic or was he a... Atheist? Well, he preferred to be called an agnostic because in the 1800s the word agnostic wasn't a dirty word, mm -hmm. but atheist was. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you put yourself in the context of Charles Darwin living in the United Kingdom in England, uh, where the, the queen or the king is the defender of the faith and so forth, he behaved as what they considered an orthodox, not religion, but as an orthodox English gentleman was supposed to live, and that was supposed to be by a Judeo-Christian ethic. Right. But he was not a Christian, never was. Though it is very funny, do you know the only degree he ever earned at college? I believe it was in theology. A Bachelor of Arts in Christian Theology, Christ College, wow, Cambridge, really 1831. Didn't know that. He wasn't even a scientist, and yet he's known as a scientist. So. Well, he had no degree in science. Right, he had no degree in science. Just theology. Uh, he, he very much was into nature, but he was not a degreed scientist. And so, uh, just as a little background there. Now, what then happens? Well, you have to have a lawgiver to have a law. So if the law of gravity exists, and we know it does, it's one of the most verified laws in all of science, there has to be a lawgiver, there has to be a creator. And then suddenly and instantaneously, suddenly realize that all laws of science, whether it's thermodynamics, motion, genetics, doesn't make any difference, all of them had to be created. They could not have evolved from something less. Then you take a look at natural process. Now, no process is of any value unless it's whole and complete. And I, I would say, for instance, this TV program, if there were not a process by which we produced the program, we couldn't produce the program, correct? That's correct. And if you remove one step, it either does not work or it doesn't work as well, correct? Yes, that is correct. So photosynthesis, the most universally accepted natural process, I suppose, for most people, it's responsible for the existence of 98, 99% of all life on Earth. If you remove one step from the photosynthetic process, it doesn't work. Right. Same thing is true, for instance, of anybody listening to the program. Um, when you were in school, you determined some methodology by which you learned the best. Now, I don't know what it was for each of you, but I'm just simply saying, you, you figured out to succeed in school, I have to use this method. So you read it once, you got it. You read it three times, you got it. You got to read it out loud, because if you hear it, you got it. Or you got to see it in pictures. Mm -hmm. But we all have these processes, and they don't work as well, or they don't work at all, unless they're complete, mm -hmm. which means they had to be created. And of course, I had reevaluated the physical evidence. Now, I mentioned that I had been an evolutionist, believed it, taught it, uh, but that it had always been a seeker of truth. Now, it's much worse than you realize, because I grew up on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. Oh. Okay. Isn't that like liberal America right there? That, that, that is the capital of liberalism, the capital of evolution. It right. is the Athens of the modern world. Oh, wow, yeah. It, it yeah, is yeah. to the world what Athens was 2,000 years ago. But that's where I grew up. Well, that makes sense then that you taught evolution. Well, I didn't graduate from Berkeley, but I got quite an education there growing <laughs> up on campus because my father was a professor there. And at one time he was a secretary to the president. So. Wow. But after I completed my ninth year of public school education, we moved to Washington, D.C., and I actually went to high school in the District of Columbia, which is like going to high school in Albania. <laughs> well, if you've ever been to Washington, you know what I mean. They're both yep, foreign yes, countries, yes, and they're absolutely. both equally dangerous. Yes, yes, so, yes. But to, to demonstrate my search for truth, I used to do my high school homework at the Library of Congress. Oh, wow. 
That's amazing. Kind of gives you an idea of my seriousness when I say I'm in a secret truth. Mm -hmm. So, reevaluating the physical evidence, I found that what they had taught me in school was not what was in the ground. Mm. Now, there are layers in the ground, there's fossils in some of the layers that are absolutely true. But the layers are not in the order they show in the textbook. Nowhere in the world can you find that, that order. Nowhere. Nowhere. There are 25 locations where you can find some of the layers in the order shown in the textbook. But there's nowhere in the world where you can find all of them in one place, in the order shown in the textbook. Okay. As a matter of fact, I'll give you two numbers. Um, you know, the Bible tells us there was a worldwide flood. We're talking about why you should believe in the Bible, right? Yes. Now, think with me for a second. Uh, I used to spend my time as a child at Berkeley. When I wasn't in school learning evolution, I used to spend it in the paleontology laboratories at Berkeley learning about dinosaurs, fossils, and evolutionary theory from PhDs when I was just a child. So I knew about this stuff pretty good. But, but they tell you, oh, here's the layers in the ground. It's in this order. These are the creatures that lived at different times in the past, often illustrated next to the layers and so forth. However, let me describe what we actually find in the ground. 75 to 80 percent of the entire Earth's dry land surface is covered with dried out mud layers containing trillions of dead plants and animals that all drowned. Mm -hmm. Now, does that sound like slow gradual accumulation over millions and billions of supposed years or the result of a one year long global flood? Yeah, mud, flood. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just mm -hmm. it. See, you only find fossils in sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is just dried out mud. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. simplistic, but it's absolutely correct. So, 75 to 80 percent of the entire Earth's dry land surface is covered with dried out mud layers containing trillions of dead plants and animals that all drowned. Right. That speaks of a worldwide flood. When you understand the layers of ground coming from a worldwide flood, it makes much more sense, mm -hmm. much more scientific sense than some kind of slow gradual accumulation. <music>
Some of them did it to get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. uh, some just parroting what they were taught. And, and it, in essence, that's what I did initially, mm -hmm. parroting what I was taught. But there were those who actually knew it was wrong and mm -hmm. still taught it anyway. Wow. Why? Because they wanted me to support their religion. They philosophically wanted to, to get me to accept their religion. Well, of course, I don't anymore. And we're talking about apologetics. I'm a Christian apologist, right. a defender of the faith. So when you start taking a look at science, you suddenly realize that science, good science, supports the Scripture. Now, the Bible doesn't need science to support it. The Word of God should be sufficient on its own. Mm -hmm. But good science does support what the Bible says. The Bible is, and excuse my expression, hyper-accurate. Now, you don't read the Bible uh, literally. You read it as inerrant. There's a slight difference there. You don't read it literally because, after all, in what language? Hebrew, Greek. You know, well, if you read the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, you can read the original language. But but are you going to read it no, with a language English. common to, translated. To, to what country? I mean, I work in Russia. I work in Brazil. Do we take it literally in Portuguese? Do we take it literally in Russian? Right, Do you take right. it literally in English? And the answer is no. God is a perfect author who uses the same tools that we do because we cannot use literary tools unless he used them first. Right, right, right. He can't put within us something he does not have or cannot do. So if we use metaphor and simile and parable and proverb and allegory, it's only because he can too. And the Bible's full of this, you yeah. know, the book of Revelation, you know, and the ten horns are. So there's an, you know, it says this is a metaphor and this is what it means. Mm -hmm. Jesus often explained his parables. That's right. Right? Yeah. So he told a story, and they said, and this is the way you're to understand the story. Yes. So we do take it as inerrant in all respects. And good science supports the Bible. So that's where I get involved with this. Okay. Uh, now, you'd asked about the age of the earth. Well, of course, at one time I believed the earth and the universe were billions and billions of years old. I don't believe it anymore. And I don't believe it for very, very good reasons. Now, the Bible is quite specific. The earth is a little over 6,000 years old. I've noticed the older I get, the older the universe gets. <laughs> um, but, but it was easier to teach this in the year 2000. You could say 6,000 years ago. But, but nonetheless, uh, the Bible is really quite specific. When we take a look at the genealogies, especially of Luke, mm -hmm. then the genealogies only go back 6,000 years. Right. Period. Now, Let's take a look at the science. There are over 300 what are called scientific geochronometers. Now, what is a geochronometer? Is that like a watch or something? In essence, geo is the ancient word for matter, universe, can be the earth, you know, geo, like geography, geology. And chronometer, of course, is a timepiece. Okay. So a geochronometer is an earth time clock or a universe time clock. We have over 300 of them. On my website, I have over 100 little videos. They're called shorts. Mm -hmm. But they're all less than five minutes, most less than three minutes, some only a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. Free to anybody who wants to go there with over 100 reasons why these millions and billions of years have never happened. Right. I do programs. I've got DVDs of, of major reasons. These are just little ones. They almost throwaway kind of stuff, you know. Because of this, it can't possibly be old. Because of this, it can't. They're all called Did You Know. <laughs> it's a Did, Did You Know videos. So, for instance, talking about uh, lumpy rings around planets or the heat loss of the Earth, just a little throwaway type stuff to prove that the Earth is, in fact, only 6,000 years old. Then you talked about, what about the days? Are they six literal 24-hour days? Yeah. That w I, I know I told you before that I, I was like, I'm skeptical on that one. Well, I, I know that you're particularly skeptical about day six. Yeah, just day six. But, but let me assure you, all of them are 24-hour days. Or, or really, technically, remember, a day is not 24 hours. A day is one rotation of the Earth, mm -hmm. to be more mm -hmm. accurate. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, if I took you and put you in a coal mine, closed the door, and turned off the lights, you'd be in absolute utter darkness, correct? That is correct. But if I then allow the Earth to make one complete rotation, and then I turn on the light, you would have experienced a day of time, mm -hmm. even though you had no reference to light, correct? Yes. Right. Now, God tells us that each day is 24 hours in various ways. For instance, there's one period of darkness, one period of light. Obviously, that's one rotation. Mm -hmm. 
God uses the word yom, which is the common Hebrew word for day. Uh, it's used over 3,000 times in the Old Testament. But, uh, for instance, in the book you just held up, I have four pages. Yeah, it's just creation our worldview. Uh, but, but I have four pages where I copy every single possible nuance of the word yam mm-hmm. from the two largest Hebrew lexicons in existence to prove that it cannot be an epoch, an eon, an era. It can't be millions and billions of years with an indefinite ending and an indefinite uh, start. Right. It cannot be used that way. It can be used as something other than right now, but only such as the day of the Lord, the day of Jacob's trouble, or in my father's day. Now, that's future, it's past, but it's specific, mm-hmm. correct? Right, right. Then, then God uses what are called natural numbers. When he says it's day one, day two, day three. So one, two, three. Those are natural numbers. Right. So he's counting specific rotations of the earth. One rotation of the earth, two rotations of the earth, three rotations of the earth. Jesus talks about Adam and Eve were there at the beginning, correct? Yes. Did he say they came along millions of years later? No. Right. But here's the verse that you really want to write down. Because if you go to Exodus, now this is the one that absolutely establishes scripturally Okay. That these days are 24 hour or one rotation days. You go to Exodus chapter 20. That is the middle of the giving of the Ten Commandments. I think that you would agree, even to a non Christian, the giving of the Ten Commandments is a pivotal point in human history. Yes. I mean, if you think the Code of Hammurabi would be, so would the giving of the Ten Commandments, right? Yes. It is so important to God that you know these are 24 hour days that in the middle of the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, God stops. And he says, you shall work six literal 24-hour days and rest one because I worked six literal 24-hour days and rested one. Now, he equates the days of creation to the days that you and I experience today. So there's an absolute equivalence that these are literal 24-hour days. So what about in the New Testament when Jesus say, the hour is near, and he kept saying it. When he say an hour is near, is that literal? Literal as well? No, like, but no, that's a literary term. Yeah, so that's not like an actual 24, like, like no, he's an actual saying, hour. No, he's not saying it's 24. And I'll give you another one that people tend to trip over, you know, mm-hmm. that, that to the Lord a thousand, a thousand years yeah, is yeah, yeah. like or as a day and a day is like, okay. right? But remember, any time in any piece of literature, I don't care whether it's you writing it or God writing it, when it says is like, it does not mean equal. Mm-hmm. Right. Always substitute the word similar. Mm-hmm. Okay. To God, a thousand years is similar to a day to us, and a day to us is similar to a thousand years for Him. And in the context of where that's being used, it's talking about God's long-suffering ability to deal with sinful human beings. So when He said the hour is near for my suffering or what? But, but versus, uh, compared to eternity, the hour is near. <laughs> That's Correct. True. Yeah. So there's a relevance of, of what time frames okay. are we talking about, right? I like that. I like right? that. I like that now, okay. and again, in that scripture dealing with a thousand years in a day, it does not say a thousand years equals a day. And if it mm-hmm. did, that would add what? One thousand years to the age of the earth? Yeah. It would add, I guess, five thousand? See, if it, no, I mean, if it's been six, that would make it seven. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. right. Why are we arguing over that? Right. When it obviously isn't millions or billions. It's right. definitely not millions or billions. Cannot I just, be. I think my thing is because we're in currently in the seventh day and that's not 24 hours. And then at the sake of sounding, ar- sounding arrogance, I know that he could have created, he, he did create everything very quickly. But when it comes to Adam and Eve, we're human beings. We're in his image. So we need more time than 24 hours. No, no. We need more time. He does not. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Again, again, to say that he cannot do everything on each day as he describes mm-hmm. is to diminish his ability, authority, his sovereignty. Right, right. And you're diminishing his power. You're saying he's not omniscient and he's not omnipotent. I feel like because he spent so much time with Adam before creating Eve. But, I, I but it like isn't that much time. No. No, it really isn't that much time. First of all, uh, I mean, I think all Christians struggle with the problem, so you're not yeah. at all unique. Right, I think right. all Christians, when you come to understand that the earth and the universe are young, only 6,000 years old, talking about 24-hour days, the big thing is, well, how can he do all this in that amount of time? Yeah. And I struggled with it, I openly admit. However, I've now been studying science mm-hmm. for 
65 years. I've been studying the Bible for 45. Wow. And my, my conclusion is that's why he takes so long. Because he could have done it in just yeah, seconds. <laughs> but you see, we don't have the concept of what true sovereignty is. No, that's true. So, for instance, um, in England they have a king. Not at the moment, but I mean, they, they've had kings, queens, but they've had a monarch. And if we go back, you know, a thousand years, the monarch had absolute authority over life and death. Literally. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like your looks, kill you. Uh, that's absolute sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. Over life and death. Yes. It's also absolute sovereignty over the physical realm. Mm -hmm. It's absolute sovereignty over even time itself, actually, which is why he can step in and do miracles occasionally, as he does. But the fact of the matter is, there isn't anything on day one through five that he could not have done in the first second, because when he speaks, it happens. Right. That's absolute sovereignty. We haven't had a sovereign in the United States for over 225 years. Um, in Russia, where I do a lot of mission work, they haven't had a sovereign in 100 years, because in 1917, they killed him, <laughs> right? So we, we fail to understand what true sovereignty is, but it's to speak and things happen because you command them to, that, that God can speak and atoms and matter and energy will come into existence in a complete total vacuum where there was absolutely nothing simply because he commands it, right? Now, on the sixth day, which is the one that most people have a problem with, I absolutely agree that while I believe on the first five he could have done it in the first second of each day, though he could have spread it out, we don't know, but he does everything in 24 hours. On day six, we tend to say, well, there's obviously a time sequence. You know, he makes Adam, makes him the first farmer in human history, has to tell him he's alone because he doesn't know it, mm -hmm. promises that he's going to make an equal who will complete him, and that's what it really says in the Bible, then puts him to sleep, performs the first human surgery, then he makes Eve from the living material taken from Adam, transforms her into the woman, brings her to the man, Adam accepts the perfect gift, and there's the marriage ceremony. But actually, if you think about it, it's not that big a deal in 24 hours. And again, people tend to think about, well, he named all the animals. Well, now, wait a minute. He didn't name all the animals. He didn't name those that were in the ocean. God brought before him those animals he was to name. Now, Adam knew the name to give them because he had a complete whole vocabulary. He was able to walk and talk with God. And God never says, here's the names of the animals. He says, you name them. You've got a vocabulary. After all, you can walk and talk with God. You've got to have a pretty good vocabulary. Mm -hmm. That's true. But people said, well, he couldn't possibly have said, well, this is a poodle, and that's a dachshund, and this is a German shepherd. <laughs> and that's absolutely true because, let's face it, nature would never make a poodle anyway. <laughs> so what he said is, those are dogs. And you have to remember, we now know scientifically wolves, coyotes, dogs, and foxes are one kind. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get all four from one pair. Okay. Same thing true with a lot of everything else. He said, you know, that's a horse, that's a cow. And that's all we're talking about here. And it doesn't say he named everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And why did he do it? It wasn't because he couldn't name them later. It was to point out that God had not yet made the equal who would complete him because he was showing them everything else is already paired up. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Because it says there was not found yeah. an equal to complete right. him. Yeah. Therefore, God puts him to sleep, does the surgery, makes Eve. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you really start thinking about it, you realize that 24 hours is okay. I guess so. Uh, again, we're talking to Dr. Grady. And uh, if you are interested, and we hope that you are, you'll come back and watch again next week, and we'll continue our series with Dr. Grady about why we should believe in the Bible. Bye. 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 Thank you.